Hello, welcome to the Reykjavik News Desk. I'm Andy Sophia Fontaine, and this is the week's top story in Iceland. That's right, singular story, because there's just one story that I'm going to re be reporting on in this episode, because it's a pretty important one. On Wednesday evening, the Icelandic Parliament passed into law a sweeping bill on people seeking international protection in Iceland. This marks the fifth time that this bill, with some changes, has been submitted by the Independence Party to Parliament. Only on this fifth occasion, it actually passed. This bill, which was submitted by Minister of Justice Jón Gunnarsson, is cause for concern in a lot of ways, not least of all because it takes an already bad situation and makes it worse. So I'm going to explain in this video exactly what it makes worse and how the current situation is already bad enough when it comes to people seeking international protection in Iceland. Now, in terms of the vote count for this bill, every MP for the Social Democrats, the Reform Party, and the Pirate Party voted against this bill. Every other MP voted in favor of it, except for those who were not present. Now, bills, of course, do not go directly from someone's desk straight to the halls of Parliament. They are posted on the relevant ministry's website for special interest groups and individuals to offer their own commentary and opinions on the bill in question and to suggest changes if needed. Here are some of the groups who opposed this bill. Amnesty International, the Icelandic Red Cross, UN Women in Iceland, the Icelandic Human Rights Center, the Directorate of Health, UNICEF. Why were they against this bill? Here's a few reasons. When you submit an application for asylum in Iceland to the Directorate of Immigration, they will decide whether or not to accept it or reject it. They may examine your case. They may not. I'll get to that later. If they reject your application, you can decide to send this on to the Immigration Appeals Board. By this law, this process is now done, done automatically, which does not give you a lot of time to prepare a case for appealing this decision. However, if the Immigration Appeals Board says that they've rejected your application, you then have exactly 30 days, 30 days to leave the country or you lose everything. And by everything, I mean housing and healthcare. This, as many of those groups who filed grievances against this bill have pointed out, arguably violates the human rights chapter of the Icelandic Constitution, as well as international human rights law. The law also does not ensure the rights of children who come to Iceland without a parent or guardian seeking asylum in this country, and it makes family reunification much more difficult. This arguably violates the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The bill also gives police the power to demand health information on asylum seekers from hospitals and clinics. This is information that is normally protected in Icelandic law. We have a rights of the patient, which is pretty solid in terms of guaranteeing that your personal health information can't just be handed over to whoever. Pirate Party MP Arndis Anna Kristina Dotter Gunnarsdotter called this bill reactionary, and many members of the opposition tried to submit their own changes to the bill. Now, just for reference here, um, in Iceland, it's very rare that Parliament votes on an entire bill. Rather, they'll go through each article of the bill, and members of the Parliament will vote yes or no, or abstention, for these different articles of the bill. So what the members of the opposition were trying to do here was add changes to different articles in the bill. Incidentally, every single one of those proposed changes was rejected. Asylum seekers and their allies protested in front of Parliament, calling for Parliament to defeat this bill for a fifth time. However, after its passage, alternate MP and managing director of the National Queer Organization, Daniel A. Apnason, resigned from the Left Green Party in protest. So in the beginning of this video, I said that this law makes a bad matter worse. It makes an existing matter much worse. So I think I sh you should know a little bit about... Um, asylum seekers in Iceland, people who seek international protection here. In my career as a journalist, it's a subject that I've covered pretty extensively, and so I have some knowledge on the subject that I can pass on to you here. First of all, when I talked about here that if a, an asylum seeker does not leave the country within 30 days of getting a rejection from the Immigration Appeals Board, they will lose all their rights, that being housing and health care. By housing, we're not talking about like each asylum seeker getting like a one-bedroom apartment or something. They don't even, they sometimes don't even get a room to themselves. There are designated asylum seeker centers, and they're usually in areas that are cut off and hard to reach downtown from, where people share a room together. Um, they're not allowed to work, they, so they don't get an Icelandic identity number, which pretty much cuts you off entirely from society. 
they are by law not allowed to work. Instead, they get um, grocery shopping cards with an allowance of about 8,000 kroners and maybe a bus card. Um, they have access to emergency medical services, but from what I've told, that's even spotty at best. Furthermore, in these shelters where they live, they're not allowed to have any visitors at all, even the press. The only visitors that they're allowed to have are people who have been sanctioned personally by the Ministry of Justice to come visit them. So whenever I had to speak to any of these asylum seekers, I would always have to meet elsewhere. I was not allowed actually into these facilities. Also, when I said earlier that when you submit an application for international protection with the Directorate of Immigration, that they'll either accept it or reject it, that's if they even examine your case at all. And in most cases, they do not because of a little thing called the Dublin Regulation. This is an international agreement whereby signatory countries have the right, although importantly, not the obligation, to deport somebody back to a country where they were previously granted asylum. In other words, if they see that an applicant was already granted asylum in another country before they came to Iceland, the director of immigration will just say, okay, well, then we can't, we're not going to grant you asylum here. You already got asylum in this other country. You're deported. And on its surface, this may seem like a common sense solution, but when you look just, just beneath the surface, it's actually much more complicated and more cruel than that. First of all, there's a concept of applying for asylum. Not everyone applies for asylum willingly. Greece, for example, is a major point of entry for many people fleeing war and persecution in the Middle East and in Asia. And so you will have examples. For example, there's a couple of Palestinian people that I spoke to who um, recounted how when um, they took a boat from Turkey to Greece, they were met by Greek authorities who said, you have to apply for asylum in Greece or we're sending you back to Turkey. And so they applied for asylum in Greece. Well, what's wrong with asylum in Greece, you might be asking. Well, maybe it's not so bad to get international protection in Greece. Well, let me just read you this one passage, if I will. This is from um, a November 2020 report called Report on the Living Conditions of Beneficiaries of International Protection in Greece. So this isn't even people who just showed up in Greece. These are people who have been expressly given international protection, who have been granted asylum in Greece. Quote, a number of international and national courts have already held that the living conditions of asylum seekers and recognized refugees alike in Greece are so dire that they are capable of amounting to inhuman and inhuman and degrading treatment under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 4 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, or Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and therefore prevent the return of persons to the country in ac accordance with the principle of non-refoulement. Non-refoulement is a legal concept whereby you can't deport somebody to a place, a country or region, where their life or their well-being or health would be in imminent danger. And Icelandic law does have a non-refoulement clause. It essentially says that if somebody has been granted asylum in another country, then their application will not be examined or considered. Except, quote, if the application of the first paragraph of Article 36 would lead to a violation of Article 42, for example, due to circumstances in the country to which the applicant is to be sent, the application shall be considered. And Article 42 that's being referenced here says, quote, according to this act, it is not permitted to send a foreigner or a stateless person to an area where he has reason to fear persecution or due to circumstances similar to those in the refugee consent or in imminent danger of dying or being subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment. Now, given everything, that these international organizations have reported on in terms of people who are granted international protection in Greece, the conditions they have to live under. They've been screaming over and over and over again that sending somebody to Greece, to deport somebody to Greece, is a violation of the, the non refoulement clause. But Iceland continues to do it. The Directorate of Immigration has deported people to Greece repeatedly and will likely continue to do so again. So that's what I mean when I say that this new law has made a bad situation much worse. 
what makes this especially terrible to consider, and the reason why so many people oppose this law is for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being that we actually are in the midst of a labor shortage. Despite our country being a part of the European economic area, we still don't have enough workers, and we have people coming here who are willing to work, hundreds of people who are willing to work right now. Our population is aging as well. Like we're not making enough new people to be able to help pay for us when we get older in retirement. But apart from purely economic and financial reasons, we also need to consider what kind of country we are. What kind of people do we want to be? Are we a compassionate country? A sanctuary for people fleeing war and persecution and hate? Do we want to have an open society? Do we want to have a democratic and tolerant society where people can come and make a new life for themselves and be welcomed to do so? That might be up for future generations to determine and future historians to judge us on. A lot of the information that I got for this video is from a group of activists who run an Instagram account called Fetlem Frumvarbif, which literally means defeat the bill. Um, I've linked to it in the description. I've also linked to the reports and the laws that I've mentioned in this video. So you can check them out from yourselves. Some of them are in Icelandic. Try running them through Google Translate and maybe you'll have some luck. Not all this stuff has been translated into English. Anyway, that's all I have for you today on the Reykjavik News Desk. Um, if you like the content you see here, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you really like the content you see here, check out the Patreon link in the description below, which reminds me, I want to give a thanks to Corinne Vasquez and Marion Ward for becoming patrons on the $20 level, Marion Moores and Laura Johnson for becoming patrons on the $15 level, and Stephen Ellis and Vivi Carvalho Schaffner for becoming patrons on the $10 level. Thank you so much for your support. Continue watching, and as always, be good to each other.